Welcome back. The South African Reserve Bank has made an emergency interest rate cut. The bank cutting a borrowing cost by 100 basis points, reducing the rate to 4.25%. This is the second rate cut of 100 basis points of this year after the South African Reserve Bank lowered interest rates in March. It marks another move by the bank to absorb the effects on the economy of the spread of COVID-19. May's monetary policy meeting was originally scheduled for next week but the bank has decided to make the emergency move the South African government does not have a problem financing this deficit the South African financial markets are deep and liquid and could meet the financing requirements of the South African government we did, however, when we saw that uh, there was a dislocation in the secondary market, decided that we would provide liquidity so that the financial market continues to function, so that the South African government could continue to finance itself and all the other issuers in the South African market who use the bond market could continue to finance themselves. We also did this because the manner in which our uh, repo rate system works is that it works on a collateral basis. And the collateral that we take at the um, SAR uh, is uh, in the form of government bonds. Now, when you take collateral, you better know what the value of that collateral is. And if there is a dislocation in the market, that means it is difficult to price the collateral. And that is why the Reserve Bank got involved in the secondary market. There's more calls for African countries to get debt relief from the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. China has also weighed in offering the same for African countries that are highly indebted. Meanwhile, the decision by the Reserve Bank to, to cut the repo rate by 100 basis points has received a mixed reaction. While some uh, welcome the move, others could be left in limbo. And according to the Reserve Bank, the rate cut is good for debt holders, but bad for income earners. For more on this, we have David Rod, who is Chief Economist at Efficient Group. Thank you very much uh, for coming through. David, let's start first with a recap on how the markets have been performing. I I'd like you to recap for us since last week, you know, the JSC started on the back foot, but there was an impressive rally towards the end of the week with the rent also rebounding yeah. from the 19 levels to the dollar. Yes, indeed. Now, we saw quite a, quite a volatile market last week. It was all over the place. And I think it's important to understand is that the South African financial markets are affected, of course, uh, by this, what is happening locally, like, for example, a change in interest rates. But the South African financial markets are also very much affected by what is happening internationally. And there were a number of announcements internationally from the Europeans and from the Americans and from the Chinese uh, in terms of uh, uh, the policies that they will put in place uh, in order to support the economies and that had a positive spillover effect on the South African fin financial markets as well. And we started the day off not too bad, certainly, and I can give you a quick rundown on what happened today. The all Sea index, for example, closed with nearly 4% up today. That's a huge one, nearly 4% up on the all Sea index. And most indices are up, for example, the resources more than 7% better. Well, uh, I think that's perhaps the most important one, the resources, and I see the top 40 are also more than 4% better uh, today. Uh, for the rest of the market, the RAND is under pressure today because of this uh, surprise cut by the Reserve Bank. The RAND is at 18 Rand 36 now for a dollar, 23 Rand and 10 cents for a pound, and 20 Rand and 12 cents what you're going to pay for a euro. For the rest of the world's market, the American market just opened more than a percent better already, but most of the other markets in the the East as well as the European markets are today not doing too badly. The gold price, 1732 and the oil price stands at $27.81. Something else that I think is important to, to mention as well is that the bond market of the surprise announcement by the Reserve Bank appreciated quite nicely. And in the case of the R186, uh, that, that specific instrument gained 50 basis points uh, today. And that is, of course, after the announcements by the South African Reserve Bank.
Okay, so it means that the announcement of the repo rate cuts couldn't have come at a better time. And for somebody who's sitting at home without us being technical, what does it really mean for somebody who is a, a bondholder or having a, a loan or having to pay back a car? Yes, well, it means if you have to pay back a car, if you were a bondholder, you're going to pay, you're going to pay less. You're going to pay 1% less. And of course, a lot of people uh, that are very much indebted, especially at this time of of the crisis and as well as the reality that many people are likely to lose their jobs or maybe get a, a, a smaller salary in future, this certainly comes as, as a welcome surprise. Unfortunately, there are many people and individuals that are also dependent on interest income and they will also now from now on receive less interest every month because of the cut in the Reserve Bank. The decision by the Reserve Bank to cut interest rates uh, was not really a surprise as such because uh, most economists I included expected the Reserve Bank to cut interest rates by 100 basis points. In fact, I think there was space. The surprise was that the Reserve Bank decided to do it uh, a week earlier than previously uh, thought. And, and I think that is where the danger is. The danger is, is that the Reserve Bank may create the impression that they're running out of options, that are getting a little bit panicky, and I think they have to be very, very careful about that. As an economist, I can also tell you that this is not, it's unlikely to have much of an impact on the economy. It is certainly going to help some individuals and some businesses, but it's relatively small in terms of the kind of support that can be expected because of this cut in the economy. We need something else. We need significant fiscal adjustments in order to fix the economy. Monetary policy certainly will help, but this is really uh, on the margin and not really that much from a macroeconomic point of view. Yeah, so it sounds like your view resonates with other analysts who are saying that actually it's bad timing on the Reserve Bank for this rate cut this week. Uh, comparatively speaking, the US made the same mistake until it was left with no fiscal space to make any other move. Well, yeah, I, the Reserve Bank can get involved in all sorts of manners in the financial markets. The Reserve Bank can cut interest rates, and most people think that's all that the Reserve Bank does, but they do far more. They get in way in a way that banks are managed, and they've been doing that as well. And the Reserve Bank, like the governor just said, they are getting involved in the secondary market and the bond market. Now, that kinds of impacts at the current junction where we are are far more significant than cutting interest rates. So I am a little bit at a loss why they decided to cut interest rates now. Not I'm, I support the cut, of course. Uh, but I, I'm just a little bit of a loss because of the timing. But the Reserve Bank is doing a good job. I don't want to criticize the Reserve Bank. It's just a bit of an awkward timing for a week before the time when they decided to cut interest rates. It really came, nobody really expected that. 1%, uh, yes, yeah, certainly. A week before the time, I don't know. Well, you're not criticizing the Reserve Bank. You are just unpacking their decision. And of course, we disagree to agree at the end of the day. But then I want us now to look at the notion that African countries that are highly indebted should get assistance from the IMF as well as the World Bank. And also China making an announcement that it can consider uh, to come and assist. But you know, the, the, the issue here comes as a result of the view that th there could be superpowers now uh, fighting for the African market and, you know, the notion of neocolonialism. What do you make out of that? Well, you know, the function of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank are exactly there to, to tie countries over in certain circumstances. In the case of the World Bank, typically, and of course they've changed their functions over time, but in the case of the World Bank, typically they're supposed to fund big uh, projects. And that's the reason why many people owe, or many countries owe the World Bank a lot of money. The function of the International Monetary Fund traditionally was to support countries when they have especially balance of payment issues. And again, they've expanded their, their mandate a little bit over time. And in the process, a lot of countries owe, uh, countries owe a lot of money to the International Monetary Fund. And in fact, yes, there were talk, and there still there is talk, uh, going around the possibility of assisting emerging economies, especially emerging economies that are suffering because of a huge outflow of capital from those countries. And I, I, and I know there are people are calling this uh, new colonialism and people are giving it all sorts of names, but the reality in the end is, is that is where the money is. And if you really want, if you are in trouble financially and you need to be tied over for a couple of years, perhaps, like South Africa eventually may become, then it, it doesn't really matter where the money comes from. And I can also tell you that the requirements that are quite often required by the IMF, for example, are used for the good of those uh, specific economies. We in South Africa, we don't need an IMF loan, not yet, certainly, but there are many, many emerging econ economies that are in very, very deep trouble, and I believe 
that the IMF and the World Bank and some other international institutions will try to assist them in one way or, or the other. There certainly is a lot of support for that. All right, so you're putting short. There has been a debate that why should South Africa even look uh, to the IMF or the World Bank when it can actually look to the BRICS Bank and stick to that instead of allowing other you know, uh, co uh, capital inflows or being highly indebted to institutions that are going to invoke a temporary relief and a future burden. Yeah, I think uh, I hear this debate all the time of whether we should go to the IMF or not, or whether we should be borrowing or not. And I think the debate is completely incorrect because we have to understand if you go to the IMF or to the World Bank or even to the BRICS Bank, and we borrowed a billion dollars from the BRICS Bank, by the way, but if you go to those institutions, you borrow dollars. So the question yet that you must ask first before you go to these international institutions is I am going to borrow dollars to do what with? You can, borrow, you can borrow, borrow some dollars to import medical facilities, for example, but we don't really need dollars in South Africa. We've got more than sufficient reserves at the Reserve Bank. There are no big loans that are falling due now that we have to redeem. We don't need dollars. And I just don't understand this narrative, this argument and this debate out there, whether we should go to the IMF or wherever. Because I don't see the need of borrowing dollars at the moment. Maybe in future, mm -hmm. when we are running out of uh, reserves from the Reserve Bank, but for a moment, that certainly is not necessary to go and borrow huge amounts of money from the International Monetary Fund, as an example. Right. Thank you very much for your time. Thank right. you. David Roth is Chief Economist at Efficient Group and of course talking to us about the meaning of the decision by the Reserve Bank to cut the repo rate by 100 